Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kemler, and our next guests are two of the stars of the uh, new beautiful and heartwarming comedy, Come As You Are. It's the story of a group of disabled young men that take a road trip across the country in order to get laid. Uh, please oh. welcome Greg Rosenmeyer and Janine Garofalo. Thank you. Is that what it's about? Is that what? Is Not that entirely. What it's about? There is so much. There is oh so much more to it. That, that we told her we were making Good Will I Hunting have, too. I don't like that kind of. Oh, that's what the that's offer. Vulgar. I thought they were just going to Montreal to uh, see the sights. To see the see sights. 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 And they called the show The Blacklist, Lis Noir. <laughs> That's right, um, Montreal. First and foremost, I want to talk about uh, building this movie from the ground up. You were a producer on it, per the, this character that you portray. But first and foremost, and I started saying this to you in the green room. I'm sorry, um, is the building coming down? It is, going to, it is going to collapse. We have a certain amount of time to finish this interview at a certain <laughs> speed. Oh. And if we slow down, the building collapses. Okay. So I actually like answer. this kind of pressure. Okay, um, quickly answer the question. Oh, God, okay. Uh, it's not a question. I just want to compliment you on giving her a scene that I hadn't seen her perform in a movie in maybe your entire career, an incredibly emotional moment that I was telling him in the green room, I almost stood up and cheered because I was so excited that someone was like, yes, give Janine Garofalo well, this actually, part, she can that, do it. That is great. There have been, over the years, since I was kicked out of official show business around 2001, uh, I have Our made gain. lots of uh, independent stuff where yeah. I have had those opportunities, but it, it they, they've not made, made even the strides that, uh, that that you guys have made because you've worked so you know it takes a lot of work to get a film you know to get independent truly independent not like the Independent Spirit Awards which I'm not uh, criticizing them but that's the same people you'll see in the Oscars yeah. they're just wearing black jeans yeah. and uh, during the day <laughs> and so it, I don't know how independent the Independent Spirit Awards this is true truly uh, there's a whole world of we were truly I mean we were stuff. huge Janine fans and it was you know when, when it came time to cast Liz Scotty's mom it was like. Well, there are only so many people that my mother would approve of us casting. And they couldn't get any of them. So it's true. then, they, a lot then of them luckily, did pass. I benefited from that. No, it's perfect casting. As soon as you sort of start motor mouthing in the beginning, it's like. None this of is that great. was scripted. None really? Of it. Yeah. Like, for the, a great example of that is there's a scene where we're watching The Bachelor. Right. And I think on the page it says, oh, he did not give her a rose. And there is an entire scene. I think the whole scene's, uh, you've seen it. It's about it's about a minute and a half long scene of her. Where she can't feed you, right? she can't feed, yeah. you know, she's not feeding me because she's watching, the, she's watching the, the, the TV. And all of that stuff. I bet you don't even remember what I it don't, says. but I remember. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm, finished I'm, it, and the I'm director such a ham bone, <laughs> I'm sure I did. Mil you know, keep talking. Yeah. Like, as you can tell, I'm but it was chatty. great. Um, I am curious, uh, uh, and we'll get through this quickly. But you you mentioned it, and I've never heard you say it so bluntly. Uh, why were you kicked out of show business officially, official show business in uh, 2001? Well, and then I, I, I promise I, you, we will talk in le at length about the movie that you worked so hard. I, I'm on. so sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm actually. I'm, I also I'm want somewhat to know. Yeah, I want to hear the story. I'm somewhat exaggerating, but I think uh, Dixie Chicks. I, I, no, no, no. I, I accidentally uh, got lucky in the 90s. Worked a great deal, and then I think it's one of those things where you're very associated with something, and then a combination of getting older, uh, getting more involved in political activism yeah. d uh, during a lot of people forget that time. Especially 2001, 2002, yeah, where yeah, yeah. if you were even lightly liberal at that point, if you, you were, were crazy. reasonable. Even if yeah. you were, if you're being reasonable, which I uh, was and am, uh, and also it's just, it's just, and then I'm not, I'm not really like a. A, a, a hustler in that way. You have to. You have to really work very hard to stay to keep that umbrella of continued success above your head, and uh, unless you're very, very lucky. And uh, and I and I, I. That's. I'm the kind of person that whenever anybody tells me I can't do something, I am so grateful. <laughs> so I, if that paints a picture. What does that now, mean, Janine? Janine, hard relate. <laughs> Hard relate to that. <laughs> Deep same. <laughs> I don't like to go outside during the day, really. Someone says, you can't do that. I'm like, oh, okay, great. I know. I I guess, like, oh, okay, great. I was hoping I can, you would say that. I can I stop trying. That's By great. the way, that's but so anyway, interesting. It's very interesting to hear about that because that's some, I don't know what we're doing here. It's my By son. By the way, that's so interesting. Beautiful. It's just so interesting son. to hear about that because that's just a perspective that you don't really talk. I mean, you know, like you've been you've been doing it for a long time. Well, I've been doing stand-up since 85. That yeah. I, I control. I've Still do it, and, and I And we had to work around her stand-up schedule. She's an amazing stand-up. No, 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 no. And let's I'm talk sure about this. Okay, let's, sorry, let's, sorry. let's get off of... Uh, we haven't seen each other in a long time, so we get excited. The, right, so... Um, let's talk about... So this is inspired by a true story, right? Um, a guy named Asta Philpot. 
Yeah, who, where, how did you, we, the script came to you, right? Some, the guy who wrote the script had heard his story and the script came to you? So, so basically, here's how, here's how the project kind of generated. It, it was a thing that really happened to this guy, Asta Philpot, who lives in England. Um, and he, uh, in 2004 or 2005, uh, went on a trip uh, to uh, Spain where he found a brothel that catered to people with special needs. And he lost his virginity there. He decided, he loved it so much that he decided he was going to put an ad on Craigslist, which there is a joke about in the movie. He put an ad on Craigslist, got a couple other guys to go with him. The BBC heard about this, picked it up, made a documentary about it. Some guys in Belgium may, saw this documentary and were like, this, is, this needs to be a movie. They made a film called Hasta la Vista, which mm, was right. a big critical critically acclaimed hit everywhere in the world, pretty much besides the U.S., and some very savvy producers who were not me uh, thought this would be a great idea for an American road trip comedy, and this was kind of shortly after, uh, I want to say, Little Miss Sunshine in the Sessions, and so it seemed like a really good idea to try and make this at like kind of the mini-major studio level, and they hired a friend of mine named Eric Lindhorst to write the script. I was in a writer's workshop with Eric, uh, and he asked me to read the role of Scotty, which is that guy, mm -hmm. uh, in, in this writer's workshop. This is in 2013. And, I mean, even we read the first 10 pages back then, and I was shaking. It was just the most incredibly written character, the most incredibly written script. Like, I, I you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, like, hard to find good material at any level, let alone, like, to be some, like, you know, 21-year-old dude who's broken has to go to a writer's workshop because he can't afford an acting class. And, you know, so, and I, and so it got to the point, though, that, that he wouldn't bring in new pages unless I was there to read the role of Scotty. Uh, and so I felt very, I, I felt tremendous ownership over the role, and I felt tremendous, um, oh, I, uh, I, I was invested, you know? I would improv things on the night, and and they would work in the room, and Eric would be like, "I want to put that in. I want to put that in the script," and it was, and I'd be like, "Of course, man, it's it's yours." And then we finished it, and they quickly attached a list actor after a list actor for, to that role, and you know, it's just kind of the way that the that Hollywood works, you know. And so I would just kind of have to. I equate and watch sit like and watch is like headlines. Other came up, yeah. other like the all the cool kids got to date the girl of my dreams, yeah. you know, and just hope that in the meantime that just it doesn't work out. And it really it never <laughs> happened. In the meantime, your friend's movie kept falling apart. So yeah, you could I, well, it. so I would take him out for a beer every now, like every six months, and he knew what I wanted, but he let me take him for a beer. So I, I yeah, it just like was a thing of like I would just I just kept on him, and then finally it it fell apart one time too many and. And I found myself in this position to actually get the rights and do it, which, I mean, this was, I, I would say, three years ago now, and I had never produced a movie before, and I had no idea what I was doing. All I knew was I had to try. So, and it was just one fortuitous situation after another, and somehow... We're at build with you, Ricky. Hello. Uh, you were, your performance is unafraid of Scotty's warts, uh, the worst parts of Scotty. He's a bitter person. He's fairly miserable, and he's not uh, particularly nice to, to, to those around him. Um, what was it like? Was that in the script initially when you first started working on it with, with Eric? 100%. Yeah, and that was never something that you wanted to smooth over or were worried oh, about. Well, no, because about? he. Um, I personally, I love that aspect. I love of that it. too. Yeah. That's something that I'm always drawn to as an actor. Is, I mean, there's a lot of pressure, and I feel like a lot of people. There's so much conversation about likable. I don't care about likable. I care that I understand this person, and it all felt very authentic, and it all felt. And especially as the movie goes along and, and that scene that you're talking about with Janine, like no spoilers, but that scene, you have to earn that scene. You have to earn the audience's trust. You have to earn the audience's compassion. And I, that's something that I love. Mm -hmm. Janine, how did you get involved? How did they approach you? Well, I, I, I think you just sent it to my agent. agent. Or, and, yeah. then, and then my agent said, you have an offer, which is 
music to my that's very rare when somebody says so and so which is you, shocking to wants me. you to do this and then you don't have to try and get an audition or anything like that so but no one's telling you you can't or telling you to hustle uh, well, they're just saying you can you do can. this that, that's my favorite thing is yeah. and it's already going and set up there's not uh, just and you get to go to chicago which i love um, I also love Chicago. I love great Chicago. city. It is a great it's city. Unsung in Funny my story. Uh, Chicago. You guys should stop bad mouthing Chicago. <laughs> yeah, stop it. <laughs> that's it Boston. Is, it stop it. <laughs> it sto- no, that's Boston. No, uh, uh, how do you stop it? Stop it. Yeah, that's well, it'd be yeah. more Midwest. Things like Dennis Farina, you know, kind of thing. Dennis yeah. Farina. Yeah. Dennis Farina from. The late Dennis Freeman. The late Dennis Freeman. Excuse yeah. me. Oh, I always confuse Dennis Franz and Dennis Freeman. But both Chicago, right? Uh, yes, I think. This, anyway, these are, these well, are the but, details. Oh, sorry. These I, are the details. I, I, I was going to say that. We're this the interview building. off the, the rail. The food in Chicago is so good that I meant to lose 10 pounds. To, to I wanted I wanted Scotty to be very, like, bony, you know? And, and I ended up gaining 10 pounds. Just I'm like, I'm not going to work out. Right, but the thing is, is you were sitting back. and also craft service on anything. And craft it's service. Ve- it makes it very difficult. But also the food was so good. I mean, you know, it's so good. I just don't like to eat in front of people. What was your, what was. It's true. <laughs> What was your take on this on, on this woman when you read the script? You have the part, it's been offered to you, and did you have a particular angle or take on her that you brought to the set, or was it really all Well, laid it's, out it for was you? very well written script, and also, and Richard, the director, fantastic. Richard Wong. Fantastic, Wong. Richard Wong. Sometimes, especially in the world of independent films, it's, it's very, it can be very dicey because it could be the director's first thing you know thing they've directed and a lot of times and this was not the case at all with Richard uh they just are somebody that wants to say they're a director and they were able to to get enough money together to make a film but you (laughs) once you're there you're like what in the world made you think you know I mean there's a but not at all in this which was was fantastic and it was a delight but I could tell from and then we talked on the phone just that how directed and focused everybody was that, that that this was going it just felt like it was going to be uh not one of those situations i'm referring to before and i and i was looking forward to it i i i i thought that will be interesting i did not have a particular take that wasn't on the page and also i like to leave it open to breathe i just think you had a tremendous take that wasn't on the page uh, oh well i don't know i felt what the thing is what i was going to say i like to let it, let it sit until we start doing it and see see what the chemistry is with, between people, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So you just know your lines backwards and forwards, and then you can go from there, I feel like, and, imp- and improvise within the context of the character. Do you know what I mean? Not, not trying to improvise just to go off the rails or anything like that, but to, to, to do things Just like to that. give a quick props to Richard Wong, he was a guy that I worked with on a show called Oliver Bean back, like, 15 years ago on Fox, and he was the digital imaging technician. I think that's what it's called. Maybe intermediate. Anyway, um, but He's running Media Village, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah, he was like a like a scrawny little 25 year old. I mean, not that I was like 12, but I, I knew him from that, mm-hmm. uh, and we had worked together on that, and had kind of like been in similar. We knew a lot of the same people, and somebody else was supposed to direct this, and then uh, couldn't do it because they had to go do something else, and then gave the script to Rich, and Rich said, "I have to do this. Could you please put me." in touch with Grant, um, and I was like, ah, well, I didn't know Richard Wong directed. I knew that he was a, a very acclaimed cinematographer. Right. He shot things like To the Bone, which was at Sundance a couple years ago. He shot uh, Spare Parts with George Lopez, and he was just, I got on the phone with him, and he was, we talked, he lives up in San Francisco, and we started talking as he was leaving LA, and we talked the entire way to San Francisco, and by the time I got off the phone with him, and then after I, I watched, he, he directed a great film called uh, uh, Coma the Musical uh, and another one called Yes, We're Open. And by, but by the time that we got, I'm like, this guy, how did this guy just, how did I luck out with this guy? Right. He's really incredible. One of the things yeah. that I, uh, in terms of your take or angle, and I'm sure it's, it's in the script, is how casual she is. There is no approach that his mother has in this film, I think in other films, there would be a sentimentality or there would be a, like an innate drama that she has dealing with his, his disability, but she has dealt with it for so long and it's all very casual and very, it's like without second thought. Well, it, it just seemed to me that obviously her life is difficult being a single, yeah. a single parent uh, raising a severely disabled child. Uh, that's, that would be hard on two parents, you know, and two parents that had money. This is a, uh, they weren't 
wealth, you know, the family's not wealthy. But I figured there is a day to dayness. Yeah. It's been years. He's not a little. He's not a baby. This has been years now that we do this and have a, have. This is this is what life is. But we get so. that she's a single parent just by <clears throat> seeing that she's a single parent. Right. We get that this would be hard right. just by seeing what she's doing. There is no moment in the movie where you have to turn to the camera and go, as a single mom. Right. Right. You know, which well, that would be bad writing if somebody. No, she forgot that, that line. It was. Uh, she, it's fine. But you there's that. That's, bad that's the sign of the bad writing is is laying too much expositional pipe or things. What what I really can't stand is, hey sis, we get it, your brother and sister. You know that kind of thing. Like they they. Do you remember back in sixth grade when I covered for you for Mrs. Blue? Get it? They're friends for a long time. You know what I mean? That that's bad writing, which did not exist in this script, and I don't think Richard would have accepted it. It, had it been there, you guys would have taken it. Uh, I mean, Eric away. wrote an amazing script to begin with, so yeah, it's yeah, it made it easy. And for you, um, I want to talk about producing for you in a second, even though you've already touched on it. But for you, being able-bodied and playing a severely disabled person, what was that challenge like? Was there a pressure that you had put on yourself? Um, yeah, I think anytime you you play something, I, don't, I mean, it, whether it's you know ha, whether it has to do with ability or ethnicity or anything that isn't necessarily something that you know about, I think you, you know, if you care about what you do, there's always a responsibility to try and get it right. I had the added benefit of you know having access to the real guy. Uh, we became very close over the course of pre-production and then throughout production, and I mean, even to this day, we're like still we're very very close, and that's something that I mean. As an actor, uh, my responsibility on this one was to him. Um, and I will never forget showing him the movie for the first time and his reaction and having his, not not just approval, but it, I mean, he loved it so much, both both the film overall, but also, you know, the, the character of Scotty that, I mean, my work was done. That's, yeah. Now, what about your work as a producer? This is your first time producing. It's a road trip movie. It's fairly low budget. How uh, how difficult was it? Was it always rewarding, or was it well, so sometimes rewarding, mostly difficult? I think it's both. The more difficult something is, the more rewarding something is, if you pull it off. Um, in this particular case, uh, one of the reasons that I thought that we could do this for way less, which was a, re which was a crazy idea, everybody told me at every step of the way it's like you cannot do a road movie for this budget and i had just done one the year before um and i so basically I, that's what made me think i think there is a way to do this like this road movie that i just did um and there's a great uh producer out of chicago who has become a good friend of mine uh her, na her name's jj ingram jackie jj ingram um and well we really could i mean we couldn't have done it without her because it's like if anybody knows how to do that for what we did, it was her. And so I just consulted her every step of the way. And when, I mean, from, from the beginning, I was like, listen, I, I, wanna, I wanna option this, this property. And I went to her and I was like, I wanna, I wanna do this, how do you do it? And she's like, well, you don't, because you don't know what you're doing. Um, but I was like, well, I, I, totally, but if I were to, how would I go about it? And then she would say, well, you do X, Y, and Z. And then a couple weeks later, I, I would come back to her and say, okay, well, I did X, Y, and Z. Now what do I do? And she goes, really? Okay, well now you got to do ABC, and then I would go do it, and a couple weeks later I'd come back. Okay, I did ABC. Now what? And they're like, you did ABC? Who did you do? <laughs> How did you do ABC? And then, and then eventually I ended up like, you know, may, I begging her to movie? do the movie. Yeah, and then she, and, and then we did it. Um, Gabore Sidibe, right? Gabore Sidibe. Gabore Sidibe. Excuse me. Um, I don't personally watch Empire. I think I've seen a few episodes that maybe that she's in, but she's. So good. Uh, she's so effortless seeming and so fantastic. Uh, how did you get her involved in, in, in the movie? So, so Gabby was um, one of those people who, in the earliest conversations about the film, she was like, we should, I mean, that's the dream, right? It's like, but she's an Academy Award nominee. She's never going to do it. So who else can we get? And then we went out to a bunch of other actresses who all said no. And then I just happened to have a good relationship with somebody on her on her team. And I was like, D I basically sent it over. And I was like, just, I know it's going to be a no, but just, could she just read it, you know? And, or just like, just, and they were like, sure, she can read it. And then she read it and, and I got it. I'll never forget, I, I, I woke up and there was an email in my in inbox that said, Gabby likes it, let's talk. And I'm like... <laughs> And then immediately uh, freaked out. And <laughs> but what was even crazier was uh, I, I'm, I'm calling I'm calling Rich, the director. And I'm like, 
Cabaret's interested. You got it. You got to make yourself available. And then I go back and I'm like, yeah. So when does she want to talk? And it's like, oh no, no, no. She, she, she's in. Just let us know when it's real. You know, because there was no money. There was no money. We had no money. I just sent a script. And so basically, like all these people had they. I, these were all just like we just at, begged them to do it. We sent them the script and we're like, could you please do it? And they all just said yes. And then we went and got the money. How long was your shoot? Twenty days. Yeah, yeah it was, about right. It was nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really crazy. That's wild. Yeah. Did you uh, want to kill yourself numerous times as a producer? Oh, no, never. No, well, what no, was no. really cool is I had, I had great partners. No, I never, no, are you kidding? Like, kill yourself. This was like the movie that That's I wanted to make for about. years. I, like, I have no interest in, in living my life that way. <laughs> it's I so kill hard my, like, to be a it's, it's, so, it's so hard oh, it's to get so a movie hard. made. I don't know. Yeah, like, and, and I think that's why they call base camp base camp. It's like climbing Everest, which I wouldn't do either. I don't, I, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, these things. And I remember how you were there. It's like 24 hours a day. And I, I'm not saying I don't admire it. Of course. Uh, and and I, I wish I was, I guess, more motivated. But these things are so difficult. You're actually underplaying how hard this was for you. It and, was and, and I mean that in a good way. From the day one to post-production to now. He has nonstop worked on this film. It's true. I have been kind of carrying this movie around for, you know, Three years. pretty much. And that's what it takes to and do it, it does, that kind but it's thing. also incredibly rewarding, you know? And it, and it is not something that I... Uh, it was totally a baptism by fire to actually, like, try and, and get something made, but... At the same time, the reason that I wanted to make the movie in the first place was because as an actor, I wasn't happy with the way my career was going. Yeah, I'm not either, you know? but that's the difference. I <laughs> Well, I mean... <laughs> just take I, I, the thing is, you get your heart broken constantly. You do. It's a con constant... It's, it's yeah. constant... Uh, and by the you way, think you're yeah. there and you, get, or you got the part, whether it's on, on the acting end or yours, the producing end, and you're always this close, and then you will find out... It fell apart, or they cast someone else, mm -hmm. and very unceremoniously, you'll be replaced. And it's it's so painful. And again, it's not it's not nobody makes us do this. It's an elective profession. So uh, complaining about it is really a fool's errand because people would say, "Well, do something else." Exactly. And actually, I have and no say, other. Well, I'm actually skills. kind of a masochist, so I can't do <laughs> I, anything else. I, I'm so thankful I do stand up. I don't know how other actors who don't have another uh, outlet can survive it because it, it it it's really quite painful unless you're popular. Can I ask, do you have a great... I think it's painful when you are popular. I, you, I mean, I talk to all kinds of actors at all kinds of levels and they're, you know, do you, the problems just, they change in, in scope and scale, but like there are still actors who are like, but I really want to be doing this. I'm like, well, just go do it. If right. you want to do it, just try. I mean, just try. Do you have a greatest casting heartbreak that happened in your career? There's so, uh, there's so many. Well, I was in Fight Club until I just wasn't. Um, that's really? just one, yeah. There's As been, but that, that one hurt. Yeah, I was the Whoa, part you... that Helena Bonham Carter played, which actually she's a wonderful actor, and I'm sure did a better job. I'm sorry, can we curse on this? Yeah. Can you please say a line? Sure. Can you please say? Don't make it be that line. What? Which I one am I going to say? Not the deleted line. I hope. Deleted. Never mind. Okay, it's not going to be that one. Right. Can you please say? My God, I haven't fucked like that since grade school. I will not. <laughs> yeah, don't ask her to say that. God. I don't like that kind of talk. I said that earlier. But uh, uh, I, uh, there was a number of things. Settle. Settle, Grant. Settle. Did I hear, wait, settle. Did I hear um, a number of things that happened? And then a, uh, that so Did and you that go was, through the whole like audition process? Uh, well, I it? had met, I met David Fincher. Uh, this was when I was popular. And the kind of thing happened where I would meet. Uh, the, the directors actually wanted to sit with me and just would hand me. So this happened, and and it's so long ago now. I was I was popular for a very finite amount of time, a very long time ago. But during that Speaking brief of period, selling, um, they uh, I met with David Fincher, who just handed me a script. I was on my way to going to the airport. He said, "If you like it, the part is yours." I read it, called him, and said, uh, "I I would like to do it." And then um, some time went by, and I. Uh, uh, my my agent called very upset had read uh, that uh, Helena they in the Hollywood Reporter whatever they had the casting and then I called Tate Fincher I said are you allowed to do that and he said apparently <laughs> so it's one of the, uh, what uh, I think uh, um, uh, Edward Norton who is a wonderful wonderful actor felt I didn't have the chops to do it but nobody kind of told me and uh, and he may or may not have been correct. Uh, and I think I, I respect. And then I said, "Well, can I audition with him or for him?" And um, and I and I was told at the time that he would like Courtney Love to do it because he was dating. And then Brad Pitt said, "I'm not going to sign off on that." And then they agreed on Helena Bonham Carter, who is probably much better than I would have been. But a few years later, uh, 
Brad Pitt, who I don't know, very kindly said, I'm sorry about what happened with that. And he had nothing to do with it. And actually, I live right near Ed Norton. I see him all the time. He's never said anything. <laughs> In fact, he, he pretends he doesn't know who I am every time I see him. I see him all the time. <laughs> That's true. And it better be none of us for me to lie to you to create content. I'm just, I'm saying that. And actually, I do, th I do respect that he thought that about me. Uh, I agree with him. And, but that he would not allow... Or at least that's what you're told by people. Well, it sounded people. like he wanted Courtney. Well, yeah. I, I think she would have been. I think they were dating at the time, and he 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 thought that would be a good fit um, in the part. That's per perfectly legitimate. She is. The problem is, and maybe it's a miscommunication between David Fincher, Edward Norton, who was developing that project with David Fincher. Right. Perhaps he was not told that David Fincher. You know what I mean? Did that. I mean, this is also outside of your personal stake in it. This uh -huh. isn't a great example and story of what happens in casting movies mm -hmm. all the oh, time. Oh, this time itself it's not goes on in lots of businesses. It's not just show business. It's every, yeah. You guys, you know this. Any vocation you will go in, this is not special. You get your heart broken. It, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. So this is not special. But it's not one it's, person. You think it's one person who gets to make the decision, right? It's David right, it Fincher be, who says, here, yeah. I want you to do it. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, it's this person and their agent right. and that person, their agent and the studio and person. perhaps it was not discussed fully yeah. or there was a miscommunication. That's another problem. I like to talk to people directly. It's very hard to do that. You can, and now, especially with modern technology, it's really hard to speak to someone directly on the phone or in person. They like to kick the can down the road with email or what have you. Yeah. But back in those days, I actually talked to David Fincher on a landline. On a landline in my be in my bedroom. There's still a phone jack in that room. But uh, the, that you I have a landline. Uh, I still have a landline actually in the kitchen. It just makes sense for when the grid goes down, and it will. <laughs> I've got a landline. Pregnant pause, pregnant pause. It just, it just makes sense, and it costs nothing to do it, but actually when the uh, Hurricane uh, Sandy. Sandy and the Transformer on 14th Street blew, there was no power in my building, and the, the landline worked, and, <laughs> and, it was, and it's good to have it, and also I, I don't like the, the, all the cell, the cell phone bothers me. I like to talk to, if I'm going to talk to them, on, on a landline. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, they have to Thank hand deliver you. her scripts. She doesn't have a computer or I, a printer. My boyfriend has a computer. Listen, this is, and it's not me being too cool for school. I'm a bit of a neo-Luddite because I have a lot of anxiety about it. I've tried, and also I don't want to do social media because you put yourself out of it. You know the phrase, you're your own worst critic? It's not true. There's always, <laughs> so it's not true. And my and it hurt your feelings, so I, I don't. And also, all this stuff kicked in when I was already like a middle-aged lady. I'm going to be 56, so this is, it, it's normal for me not to, to, to be so... I'm with you. I use it, and I feel like I use it simply for work. And if mm -hmm. I had the choice, I would have a flip phone, and I would mm -hmm. probably have very limited access to internet on my computer, simply because I get distracted very easily. Well, and I know and all the value me. it provides. Great democratic medium. I realize that. I am not in any way. So, but it also provides, maybe. if you let it into your life, <laughs> you have to accept everything. And there's all the data mining, all the surveillance, all, the, all kinds of things I don't think people do fully realize it's happening. Uh, and the more Everyone's everybody's coupled. swiping their phones and everybody, uh, it's just, uh, I don't want to live like that. And, and that too will hurt your career. That's my fault entirely. There's uh, Claire McCleskey, who is uh, uh, my, my uh, basically my manager with Carl Welker and David. She will attest to how hard it is she can't, to, that I can't type. I can't, I don't use a computer. It, but I'm always willing to walk anywhere. I'm a bit of a pedesto. I will go walk anywhere to pick up a script uh, and hold it in my hands. You know what I mean? Like, or whatever. I kind of miss that. I kind of yeah. miss getting a script. Like, a PDF is I like to hold it quicker. and read it yeah, in the same way like, with a book. I like holding a script. I remember, like, I mean, way back in the day, like, I did, when I did Royal Tenenbaums, I remember when, I remember getting that script. I remember, mm -hmm. I remember there was a knock on the door, and they slipped it under the door, and then I took it out, and I read it, and it was multicolored, and it was just like, and I just remember, like, it feels nice. It feels it. nice, and it looks nice, and it just it doesn't quite look the same. And you can make video. margins, and also uh, Gersh is walking distance from my apartment, and Claire is walking distance from my apartment. So, and also I don't like to exercise formally, so I make myself walk <laughs> re really fast from point A to point B. How old were you when you got Royal Tenenbaums? When you did Royal Tenenbaums? I was nine. You were nine. That was your first. That's amazing. Yeah, that was right? my first movie. Yeah. Yeah, both of your first projects really were with Ben Stiller, ben, yeah. right? Yeah, my first, because, actually, my first acting job sort of was was Gary Shandling, but simultaneously. Right, that's right. Excuse me. Um, no, so no, that's okay. But that, I was. That, that, that oh, show. thank you. That was my first acting job, and I was 27, which is pretty late. Pretty late to start, yeah. but I knew Gary from stand up, and I knew Ben from stand up, and I was just standing in the right place at the right time. Truly, that's all it was. Uh, was 
I just was plunked into Larry Sanders and plunked into the Ben Stiller show. Uh, it was a baptism by sweet, creamy chocolate. And then after came like, oh, this isn't, I see. It's not like this <laughs> all the time where it just. <laughs> you got thrown under. It's project. always tough when you get yeah. Yeah. You know, spoiled at the beginning. Or, or it, it is. I was very, very. And Gary Shanning, the late Gary Shanning is one of the best bosses I think I've ever had in my life and made the environment so enjoyable uh, and so such a great place not to learn bad habits as an actor, mm. I think. It's just was a wonderful experience. And working with Ben has always been a wonderful experience. And uh, it, it's. Uh, I was I was terribly terribly lucky, you know what I mean? It was, and had I not been a stand-up comic, and had met them that way, none of that would have happened, I don't think. Did you feel that way on Tenenbaums? Just Is like an, spoiled? an incredible, yeah, spoiled, oh, yeah. incredible experience. Oh yeah, I mean that was, uh, yeah, just catching Wes. It was like I mean to that point he had done Bottle Rocket and Rushmore, and that was his first movie working with. I mean yeah, he'd worked with <clears throat> Bill Murray, but he discovered Jason Schwartzman. This was like. I mean, the, I just remember, like, I remember I auditioned for it, and I was I was nine. I didn't have a whole lot of concept of who people were. I knew Gene Hackman was Lex Luthor, you know. I remember I knew that Ben Stiller was not uh, something about Mary, and I, I don't know if I knew Gwyneth Powell. But like all these people that were coming on, and then I and then my manager would call and be like, y "You're not gonna believe who's in the movie now." And then you get to set, and and West doesn't have trailers. He is a green room. So everybody, when you're not shooting, is in, well, like, I, I mean, I was in schooling or whatever, but when, when I wasn't, you're just hanging around on set, there's a green room. So everybody just talks to everybody. You know, you have access to these people. Hackman, and I would, too? And hack, yeah. I mean, everybody would just kind of like, everyone was like kind of afraid of him, you know. He, he didn't really actually, he liked my mom a lot. Because <laughs> my mom would sit in a corner and not talk to anybody and just read a book. And he would just start coming over and, and sitting next to her and, <laughs> and talking to her. Mom's like, hello? And so, but yeah, it was, uh, he, he was great. He was so very, very nice and protective. There was a scene um, that we were filming. It was part of that montage where he takes the kids out. Julio down at the schoolyard That montage? one, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there was one scene where we're jaywalking across mm -hmm. traffic. Uh, and my, he saw that my mom was incredibly nervous about that. It was a stunt. I mean, that's yeah. a stunt. And the way that There's it was set up. cars that are stopping, like, right at you guys. Exactly. Yeah. There are cars that are, that are, this far away from us. And the way it was set up was, you know, Jonah Meyerson, who played uh, Uzi, the other kid, was on one side of Gene, and then Gene was in the middle, and then I was on the side by traffic, and my mother's having a conniption. And Gene saw this and goes, no, no, I'm, they're over here, and I'm, uh, I, I'm against the traffic. I'm against the oncoming cars. Take two, he got hit by a van. <gasps> yep, oh and he God. jumped up onto it, and everybody comes running because Gene Hackman just said, well, it wasn't, it wasn't like, bam, go flying or anything, but he did, like, it did go a little too far, and he had to jump up onto the front of it. Uh, and he's a big guy. He was fine. Uh, had that been you? That's terrible. I would have been, I would have been, yeah, very, very hurt or dead. Um, and then, you know, it would just be Uzi <laughs> around, the, or around, uh, around these days. But uh, everybody came over, and, and I just remember Gene kind of brushed himself off, and he goes, you got it. <laughs> but like, no, he, but that was, I mean, he saved my life. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. He's good. He's a gent. I'm oh. sure Wes Anderson does not like you telling that story at all. Oh. But. Uh, it wasn't his fault. <laughs> <laughs> was the insurance it? company behind the tenant bombs at the time. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure there's probably like a statute of limitations on this thing that is now over. And I know. I've never told I mean, that honestly, fight club there, story. More, I've never yeah, told that fight the club story is going to definitely get. Man, are we just throwing. We're like, Enough time has we passed where I can't Hollywood get in trouble down. now for saying it. Truly, that's the first time I've ever told that story outside of, a per, you know, friend, long, you know, yeah. uh, with a microphone in my hand. But I feel like. Jeez, I bet I you feel not, not. It feels good to get it off my chest. I bet you no, no one involved remembers it either, because you know they've. It's, it would be something I would remember that I can see why others wouldn't remember it. You know who's gonna remember it now? Ed, well, Nor Ed Norton. Well, he's, like I said, he's finally he, gonna recognize I feel like you on the block. There's a reason he has not said. In fact, we have mutual friends. He's good friends with all the wet hot American summer people. Oh right. We have been in social situations together. There's no way. I f I know that he knows by the way he does not acknowledge me. I think no. you guys need does to just get sense? lunch and bury the hatch. But I think he is a one. I actually don't disagree with him about what he did. That's the, that's the thing. It's a, It was just that I... You love when people tell you no. <laughs> no, no, not that. I That is a fair thing to say. Do they have the chops to do this movie that he's working very hard on? Yeah. And that is a fair 
a fair thing. What wasn't fair is that I couldn't have auditioned, and also nobody told me I wasn't doing it anymore. But can I say, before I go to audience questions, I just want to say one of the things that I loved about this movie that I said at the top of this interview is that is you get a moment to prove that you mm -hmm. have chops, whether you were trying to prove it or not. I mean, it was a moment of, it felt like a victory for you as an actress who I feel like doesn't often get the chance to show her chops. Well, they're, they're, most most actors don't get 90 Five percent of SAG-AFTRA is is doing work that they probably would rather not be doing, uh, and not showing what they can do. And that's why you go and do plays and things like that to find some type of fulfillment. And the world of truly independent film provides that. But a lot of these movies don't get seen. But the uh, also it, one perception is reality. <laughs> the perception was, I guess, in the mind that that's not what the person does. And that's just the way it is. And I think sometimes it's easier to pigeonhole people and move along. It just makes the whole cast. The hardest process thing easier. about acting that I find is people love to try and tell you what you can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, don't tell me what I can and cannot do as an actor. Let me show you. And if I fail, then we will all know that we can't, that I can't do it. Mm -hmm. But let me try. Well, like I said earlier, I do kind of like it, it when people say you can't do it, but not in that case, like when you want to do something. Yeah. And uh, it's very painful to even get in the room because there's usually a short list of, in, in the world that where there's money, you know. Yeah, of course, short of, list of people of who, who can was get approved. It yeah. And they, they may sometimes let you audition. That tape's not going anywhere. Truly, it's not going anywhere. You are, they, they will allow you to put yourself on tape or you will tape it. That will never be looked at. You were never on the list anyway. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's like any other business. But you know what? Having been on the other side of it now, I don't put so much, I, I don't let it hurt me so much. Like, mm -hmm. yes, there are definitely things where I go, like if this hadn't gone my way, if it had gone to one of the, you know, seven or eight A-list act. let's face it, I was probably number 58 on the list of people who would do this part, but like in order to, but to now have the perspective of having done it, I now see that it's like, it's so not about whether, I don't even think it's about, do you have the chops? It's about eight million other things. No, no, I understand that. I was just talking and about that one thing. And also there are certain things that if you don't get it, it's neither here nor there. Then there's things that really are like the Armando Iannucci, uh, uh, Avenue Five, which is now on HBO. I auditioned. I put myself on tape three times for that because to, to work with Ar Armando Iannucci would be an, a wonderful thing, and I wanted it so bad. No, I don't think anyone's ever seen those three tapes, and in fact, it probably was annoying more than anything. Uh, that's painful when you. But the thing is, is again, this is no one forces us to do it. It's a. Uh, it, it's not a poor me scenario. I'm just. I can only honestly sell, tell you that when when it's something that you would like a chance. Just if you could look at the tape or something, that would be helpful. But it's a uh, that's nine. Like I said, most of SAG after is in this is in the same. You know thing. what I love though? They don't stop making movies. There's always another one to fall in love with. Isn't no, there? believe me, I know. It's been 20 years of me. Uh, uh, there, there's always another tape not to be viewed. It's uh, <laughs> it just keep coming like a CVS receipt. There's always another heartbreak. Just keep right pulling down the line. it. Yeah. Oh, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who's a question? Right here. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. I love your glasses, by the way. Thank you, I like yours and I like your hat. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Will Smith got me this hat 11 years ago. I huh? mean, Wait, tell that story. He never got me anything. I've never met Will Smith. <laughs> Meeting Will Smith um, changed my life. I mean, he's the nicest guy in the world. I mean, I grew up watching his movies like Pursuit of Happiness, Hancock, I'm Legend, Hitch. Um, well, I saw one of his movies, Bad Boys for Life and Gemini Man. Well, good movies. Um, speaking of Disney, what is it like working with Brad Bird and Ratatouille? That, uh, wonderful. And, and again, it, it's of no value for me to pretend it was great if it wasn't. Th that was as good as the Gary Shandling series. I'm serious, Brad Bird and Ratatouille. Because A, you're working with people that are working at the top of their intelligence. There's not going to be one ha that that is a wonderful and rare thing when somebody doesn't even they can't even make the bad work. You know, what I mean, Ratatouille it was it's such a joy, mm. and they personally uh, have over the years since I've done Ratatouille, and they do not have to do this. They still share the profits with everyone who was in that movie. They don't have to do that. Every year I get a check at Christmas. From those two. Oh my God. And, and that is, that is, that, sh and, and they are, they are socially conscious and politically aware and they make it such a great environment. So uh, I'm actually so glad you asked about it because it, it, it was a joy 
working working with both of them. What do you mean when you say working with someone who's operating at the top of their intelligence? What does that feel like on a film set? Or, sorry, not on a film on set. Anything, on, a, on anything. On anything yeah. in life. It is a wonderful thing when somebody is... Uh, just trusting their decisions. Oh, thank you for your question. Oh, no problem. And uh, the, it, it is... Because uh, some people are just journeymen writers or actors, or especially if you work on a network thing like a crime franchise or a medical franchise. It's just making sausage. That's what yeah. they do. It's 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 and and there's so many people that are just. I have uh, a question about my line, and they're like, "Don't do that." Oh just no no no! The they, line. You you know what? You can throw a fit. You cannot come out of your trailer. All acceptable. You cannot commit the sin of wanting to discuss the text, which has been my <laughs> one of my biggest downfalls. That that is that is beyond the pale for hack hack you know projects. But the the thing is is. When you are working with people who care a great deal and they are very intelligent themselves and that they do not insult the audience's intelligence, they would never say anything like they won't get it and blah, blah, blah. That's not ex not at all how those they work. Mm -hmm. And I think their body of work is evidence of that. Uh, and being a part of Ratatouille was one of the... Uh, I'm so proud to have been part of it. And then every year when I get a check from that, and it's like, it, it's, it's amazing to me. And that was a huge cast. They do that. They do that. It's one of everyone. my favorite movies too. And, and it's it just, just a wonderful and rare experience, at least for me anyway. Uh, one more. Hey, Janine. I feel like you've conquered the movies, reality bites, TV, the Ben Stiller show, stand up. <laughs> books, Broadway, is there anything else left for you to conquer? I can think of about a million things. That's amazing. You have really given me far too much credit. Although the Broadway thing was interesting. I thought it was going to be so different. That that was, uh, I, I prefer off-Broadway, put it that way. I would like to do more off-Broadway Forgive me, stuff. what did you do on Broadway? I did a, a play with Lily Taylor called Marvin's Room. And, um, Wait, like the I'm gonna go like like the movie, but did the play? Uh, well, the first? play was first, and they made a movie, and then they did the play. Again. That's so cool. And um, uh, I enjoy. I've done some off Broadway stuff. Uh, I am right now working with a wonderful writer named Anne Lanier, who uh, she has created a project that we are developing, and I hope for her sake to conquer that 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 somehow gets made, or she she somehow it is introduced to the world. I would like very much because she's such a She's, uh, 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 what I'm talking about, like, some of her writing, it's like, that's so intelligent, and uh, it, it doesn't insult the uh, the reader's intelligence. I would like to do that. I also, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I would like to actually have the tapes looked at. That's what I would like. <laughs> I would like the tapes to be looked at. That's what I would like to conquer. We just want our tapes Tape looked viewing. Just Tape watch viewing. our tapes. Thank you. Um, guys, congratulations on the film. It's a beautiful film, Thank incredible you. work from the both of you and from yeah. you as an actor and a producer. How can people see Come As You Are? When can they see it? It's coming to theaters and uh, everywhere, I think. It'll be on Amazon and iTunes. Is it February 8th or 14th? Four 14th. 14th. Is that Valentine's, 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 Day. Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. A wonderful Valentine's this Day movie. This Valentine's Day, everyone has needs. Run, oh, don't there walk. You go. That's oh, really is that good. the thing they're saying? Uh, is that I'm saying it. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm making it a thing. <laughs> You're gonna make fun of it. I, I, oh, I, was, I, was, to, I was about I like, to say I that's not the what they're saying. It's the, great. I, I pitch it to the marketing. They're like, yeah, we'll think about it. But now it's out there. But again, that's that's the kind of talk I don't like, son. It, it, it's suggestive, and we don't need it. <laughs> Everybody, suggestive give uh, give Grant and Janine a huge round of applause. Let's hear it.